Please lock me away And don't allow the day Here inside Where I hide With my loneliness I don't care what they say I won't stay in a world without love Birds sing out a tune And rain clouds hide the moon I'm okay Here I'll stay With my loneliness I don't care what they say I won't stay in a world without love So I wait And in a while I will see my true love smile She may come I know not when When she does, I know, so baby, until then, lock me away And don't allow the day here inside Where I hide with my loneliness I don't care what they say, I won't stay in a world without love Hi everyone, it's Blesky P from Melbourne, Australia Let me tell you, it's a privilege to have David Jackson He's an author and he's just written a book, right? Peter Asher, A Life in Music. That's the book. Hold the book right up. Gee, you look fantastic with that book. How long did it take to write, David? Way too long. It took uh, it took 20 years for me to do this book. Uh, having, having never written a book before, uh, I didn't really know what to expect. I, I originally started this book thinking I would just do an interview with Peter and maybe get that published somewhere. But uh, once I got into it and realized that nobody had done a book on Peter and he, with his amazing long career, I said, well, are you going to write an autobiography? He said, no, I have no interest in doing that. And I said, well, I'd like to take a crack at this. And he thought I was crazy. He said, uh, well, who's going to want to read it? It's just me. I said, well, I think some people would. So I went down the path to, uh, to writing a book. And, you know, I wasn't working on it all the time. I, I did have a job and I was, you know, just doing it when I could do it and uh, getting interviews as I could get them. So it just took way too, <laughs> way too long. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm kind of happy with how it turned out. Yeah, but that's fantastic. You've gone from a fan to meeting Peter to saying, oh, I want to write your book. Doing the book took over 20 years. To me, that's a fantastic story in itself. Now, I've got to explain <laughs> to a lot of people, right? I've interviewed Billy J. Kramer. Now, Billy J. Kramer got most of the Beatles songs. But let me tell you the story now about Peter Asher. Paul McCartney was going out with Peter Asher's sister, right, Jane. And she was into theatre. She was an actress. She was beautiful. She's on TV. She's everywhere. So this is a worldly family. Right? And they lived in Wimple Street. And Jane and Peter's uh, dad was a doctor, I believe. And they're very worldly. And Paul McCartney ended up living up in their house, right, on the top story. Yeah. And I believe that yesterday was formulated in his head, right, scrambled eggs. And I Want to Hold Your Hand was written down in the basement with John. Now, yeah. that's correct, isn't it? Yes. Now, yeah. what a yeah. history that has. And the family was so musical that sometimes when Peter did recordings, he's got his family to come in the studio and help out. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Because they're musical. That's right. Well, I mean, his mother was a uh, an oboe professor at uh, the Royal Academy of Music and uh, actually taught George Martin or, or tutored, I should say, tutored George Martin on on his oboe uh, tone. Uh, and George Martin used to come over to their house and uh, have a lesson. And then he'd bump into, you know, Peter and his sisters who were just running around the house as, you know, little kids. So uh, that's another interesting little Beatle connection there. Now, listen, yeah. I've just interviewed Billy J. Kramer. Go and play Ski P Facebook page and see that interview. It's out of this world. It's the biggest tribute that I can pay Billy J. Kramer. Now, the thing is, Beatle people have to know in generations to come that Billy J. Kramer got most of the Beatles songs, right? They were Taylor Mater written for him. But the other person who got the other songs was Peter Asher. Songs like Nobody I Know. I Don't Want to See You Again. And then Paul wrote songs like Woman. And his first big hit, A World Without Love, it was so huge, that song, I want to say. It was a number one in Australia. And when that came out, I cannot tell you, David, how huge that song was here in Australia. 
Yes. Uh, I mean, they had, uh, it was also hits, you know, in the Philippines and I mean, all over the world, it's pretty uh, unusual for you to have a number one hit right out, you know, worldwide number one hit just right off the bat. It was their first record. And I just want to say Vic Flick, he was the guitarist on that that played on the giant Bond theme as well. That's right. Yes. Um, and he played a uh, Vox 12 string electric, which uh, Peter asked him to bring. Uh, Peter already was a, a budding uh, record producer uh, right at the beginning and knew exactly what he wanted. And so he asked him to be sure to bring the, the uh, Vox 12 string with him. And that's the, the lead instrument on the record. Yeah. And also I've got to say, timing's everything. So when you've got Paul McCartney living at your house, you've just had a number one hit song, right? A World Without Love. You go to America, you play all the big shows. If you were British at that time in 1964 in the US, you were gold. Your accent was gold. Your appearance and your look was gold. Yeah. The US just thrived on British artists coming across in the British invasion. And Peter and Gordon were right there. But not only that, let me tell you, they had exquisite voices. They had that British sound that made them stand out like Chad and Jeremy. They're in the right. same vein, right? And the funny yeah. thing is now, Peter Asher has ended up with Jeremy doing shows. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, and actually, um, it's interesting at the time, people like uh, Peter and Gordon and Chad and Jeremy and, and other British acts were more popular in the United States. They had more hits there than they had back home. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. If you had a British accent and the long hair and were playing a, a half decent uh, song, you were you were gold. Yes. But the thing is, they played these songs that were just fantastic. And like, you know, you're talking about quality sound and quality songs and you're talking about a fantastic recording every time they released it. And I got to tell you, David, I'm a big monkeys fan. All right. You got to understand yeah. where I come from in the picture. And I'll mm -hmm. say this to everyone, but I'm sure you haven't heard it. Okay, in 1964, the Beatles came here and played in West Melbourne, a festival hall, right? I'm only six years old. It was crazy. I remember that. And I remember it being on TV on Channel 7, like live, and there was five there was five Beatles here because Jimmy Nickel was on tour with them. He met him up oh, in Melbourne. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I've got to tell you, it was very scary because the Southern Cross had real sheet windows. The glass was real glass. And all the fans were pressed up and it was madness and people were worried that those glass were going to break and kill people. That's right. how, That's something a lot of people don't know, but I remember that. When I heard from me to you on the radio the first time as a youngster, I could not believe the quality of the song, the sound, and what it was because there's nothing like before. Most right. of the songs were laid back songs, you know, like, how can I say, Frank Sinatra, whatever was in the groove at that time but there was nothing like the Beatles like they were it especially yeah. when a hard day's night came out in 64 mm -hmm. so here's Peter and Gordon come out do songs they're right up there in the states we learn about them here in Australia and then it comes 1967 for me and the monkeys are it I'm at the age between eight and nine where I understand music mm -hmm. so the monkeys are on TV 20th of July 1967 I right. buy their album I buy their two Australian EPs and to me, that's just my mold. But you know the great thing, no matter who you come into music first, whether it be the Monkees, ABBA, Michael Jackson, whoever, that's where you start. But everybody ends up at the Beatles. And that is a fact. <laughs> that's Have right. you ever heard that? But that is yeah. true. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, the Beatles affected so many artists throughout so many decades uh, their, their, the breadth of what they did, uh, their creativity, uh, they touched on so many different areas of music and influenced them. Anyone who comes after, uh, eventually, you go back and you go, well, okay, I, I like this, but they're saying that they got it from them. You go back and you go find out who influenced the people who influenced you, uh, and you end up at the Beatles. I mean, you can't help it. Uh, any no, any no. act that's around today, even if they don't know it, <laughs> they were influenced by the Beatles. Certainly, yeah. But no, I'm right with you with the Monkees. I uh, I was a how old was I when the Monkees TV show came out? I think it was ten. Yeah. Uh, 10 11, I bought all those albums. I I I think the Monkees are great. Yeah, but this one I got to clarify. In the year 2023, the hardcore Beatle fans and Beatle professionals like yourself. They mm. love the monkeys. Up until sure. now in the 60s, it was like 
You can't like the monkeys in the 60s. They're fake. There used to be school <laughs> fights. If you like the monkeys, you were like the younger generation. You can't like the monkeys. We're into like Sergeant Pepper, the olden kids. You're listening right. to rubbish. They're fake. This and that. That's how it was. It's only now yeah, that no, there's there was, an acceptance yeah. now of the monkeys from genuine hardcore Beatle fans. And that's what I love about it because I'm a first generation fan. I mm-hmm. experienced it. Right. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I saw him on the Ed Sullivan show when I was, I don't know, eight and said, well, that's what I want to do. You know, I uh, learned how to play the drums, taught myself to play the drums and the guitar and did bands when I was in school. And it was always but I mean, you know, good music is good music. Um, even if you they weren't playing their instruments necessarily, the monkeys on the first couple of albums, they're still great records. I mean, you know, I, I'm not your stepping stone or any of that stuff. They're great records. And then you got to uh, the third one, um, Headquarters, where they were playing their own instruments. And it, that's a great album. So, I mean, you you can't deny, you know, a good piece of music, a good piece of music, uh, any way you look at it. They had the greatest songwriters in the world. I'm not going too much on the monkeys, but I know a lot about it, right? Because that's sure. basically my group. Because, as I said, I'm born into the monkeys. That's my generation. Yeah. So when well, they, they had Neil that, Diamond, they had Neil exactly. Diamond right for them and uh, Goffin and King. And, That's right. Uh, it's great stuff. I'm glad you appreciate that side of the music. And sure. what I want to say is with the monkeys, this is how great they are, right? A lot of people don't know, but they were up for Grammy Awards in the first year and the second year. So the show came on in uh, September 66. Mm-hmm. And I'm a believer, came out in December. And let me tell you, that was the first song with a million pre ordered. And it was yeah. the first one to be number one in the UK and number one in the US simultaneously. Up until that point, no song had done that. And then the Monkeys were in the UK in February. So, I mean, they got a big influence because they were big fans of the Beatles and the Beatles well, liked the, them. Yeah, the Beatles liked uh, the Monkeys. You, you see pictures of them hanging out. Like you said, when they were in London, they were hanging out with the Beatles while Sgt. Pepper was going on. Uh, I think Mike Nesmith was there when they recorded uh, A Day in the Life. And- yeah, that's right. Will you make me tea? Make love to me. Put on the telly. To the BBC. To the BBC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. BBC One, BBC Two, BBC Three, BBC Four. Tell them how Mike Myers came up with Austin Powers and how that's in relation to Peter Asher. I think Mike Myers' father was uh, British, I believe so, or Scottish, uh, something like that. And uh, and uh, as Mike Myers was growing up, his father was, you know, indoctrinating him in all things, you know, as far as music is concerned, British music, and uh, obviously was a big Beatle fan and... Uh, Peter and Gordon fan. And so when Mike Myers was, he kind of did the character. He wanted to kind of do it as a, uh, as an homage to his father, uh, this British kind of takeoff on James Bond. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course do it in his own wacky way. Um, And it's once he was putting the look together for the character, uh, he was looking at those old Peter and Gordon, you know, uh, promotional photos where Peter has the glasses and he's got the ruffly shirt and all that. And he was like, that's exactly what I need for this character. So he did base not the character itself, but the look of the character was certainly uh, based on Peter Asher. And he admitted that to Peter. Peter told me. Uh, I talk about it a little bit in the book. Uh, but of course, Peter was saying, well, on the, you know, on the shagadelic scale, you know, I can't compete. But certainly the look was was exactly, you know, Peter Asher. And you know, the great thing now, I don't know if you've gone to YouTube, but somebody's made a video of World Without oh, Love yeah. in 4K, and I'm just saying, they look glorious. They look yeah. so great, Peter and Gordon and the sound. Like, it's brought the video 
to 2023. And I put mm-hmm. take my hat off to people that spend time and bring the old videos back to life and renew them and make them better than ever. That's where we're going now. We're going through a revolution of videos of the yeah. old ones being remade. And I just yeah. like can't tell you how great that is. Well, you know, there's a lot of that stuff that you saw when you were a kid, when you were watching television. I mean, I used to watch every variety show known to man just because I knew, oh, the Hollies are going to be on this or so-and-so is going to be on that uh, just to catch a glimpse of them. And then you think, you know, once you've grown up, you think, well, I'll never see that stuff again. It's just in your head. But now to have people dig that stuff up and clean it up and put it on, it's it's great, yeah. So the thing is that with the... uh... UK, there's one particular broadcaster that just deleted the tapes. They do the show, have the tapes there, and then they delete the tapes and re-record over the tapes. And so much great stuff has been lost. Yeah. No, they did that in the United States too. They just thought it was all just disposable and who who really is going to care. And they just reuse the tapes. Or if they just ran out of room, they just toss them in the dumpster. Um, so, yeah, nobody was really thinking too much in in terms of, you know, that this stuff that anyone was going to care 50 years later. Uh, but of course, <laughs> people like you and me <laughs> and a lot of the people that are watching this, you know, they really care. Well, I mean, again, that's one of the reasons I wanted to write this book. There's so many projects that Peter has worked on and I wanted to uh, highlight them. And uh, because there's some stuff, there was a, a band that Peter produced called the Semantics, you know, and nobody's heard of the Semantics, but it's a great power pop. If you're into power pop, you know, like Cheap Trick or Todd Rundgren or things like that. I mean, you love this album. It's hard to find, but it's out there. But I wanted to highlight, you know, just about everything that Peter's done because anything he touches, he he produces in in such an exquisite way. Uh, the way he clothes these songs and knowing exactly, oh, I need a, you know, a vibraphone here or I need a little choir here. Um, he's so good at what he does that uh, I just wanted to make sure people could, I mean, I'm hoping people read this book sitting next to, you know, Spotify or YouTube or something so you can stop and listen to it. I mean, that's really what I wanted people to do with the book is to to listen to the stuff that Peter's done. Uh, there is a, a website that I put together uh, for the book. It's peterasherbook.com. And there's an, a complete discography I couldn't fit it in the book, unfortunately, but there is a discography on my site that lists everything that Peter's uh, worked on. So, you know, just follow along and listen. Uh, It's an amazing career. Woman, do you love me? Woman, if you need me, then believe me, I need you to be my woman. Woman, do you love me? Woman, if you need me, then believe me, I need you to be my woman. And should you ask me how I'm doing, what shall I say? Things are okay, well I know that they're not, and I still may have lost. Woman. Do you love me, woman? If you need me, then believe me, I need you to be my woman. Yes, this is uh, Peter's book, uh, Beatles from A to Z. Uh, It's based on his radio show on uh, Sirius XM uh, radio. And it's, it's where he kind of goes through, uh, he highlights the Beatles music. Uh, he talks about music in depth, uh, and it's all kind of uh, alphabetized from A to Z, uh, where, you know, uh, A could be across the universe, uh, and G could be guitar. So he he basically talks about the Beatles songs, the instruments that they use, the influences that they have, uh, while occasionally dropping in a little anecdote about, uh, about his uh, time with the Beatles. Uh, but that's the book. And he was nice enough to email me and say, you know, I'm not writing a, an autobiography. This is not what this is. Uh, so it shouldn't interfere with your book, uh, which was nice of him. Uh, but yeah, he does have a book out, but it certainly isn't a, a look at his entire career, which is what mine is. Now, I really want to talk about the Beatles and about 
them coming, let's say, to Wimple Street, did all of the Beatles go and visit Paul at, at the uh, Peter Asher home? Uh, oh, I'm sure they did. The Beatles moved to London uh, from Liverpool in the early 1963, once their career was really starting to go, um, and they shared a flat. Uh, but Paul was more, you know, I mean, he, he wanted something a little more homey, uh, something with kind of a sense of family, which I think he was missing. Um, and so he was spending a lot of time at uh, on Wimpole Street with the Ashers, um, hanging out. And uh, eventually, I think uh, uh, Margaret Asher, Peter's mom, uh, kind of took pity on him and saw that he was kind of needing that kind of home life and said, well, I've got a spare room upstairs, you know, why don't you just move in up there? So for the next almost three years, I think, uh, right in the midst of Beatlemania was, you know, at full swing, he was living on the top floor of the Asher's home and uh, Peter's room is right next door to Paul's. And they both uh, had like tape recorders and sometimes, you know, with downtime, they do little experiments with music and and talk about music and and so I think Peter was a big influence on well the whole Asher family, but Peter was also I think an influence on Paul during that time, um, which I don't think he gets enough credit for. I want you to go through who he actually produced and just some of the greatest hits for everyone out there. Well, um, he started off uh, producing, uh, or his biggest, his first big hit was producing James Taylor, who he discovered when he was uh, a and at Apple Records. He signed, he, James Taylor was the first uh, signing to Apple. Uh, the first album didn't do very well, but uh, once uh, Alan Klein came on board, I think uh, Peter was kind of disillusioned. And so he left and took James Taylor with him. So he came to the United States. He did uh, Sweet Baby James, and that really kicked off James's career. He became his manager and uh, then later became uh, Linda Ronstadt's manager and started producing her. So all of those hits that Linda Ronstadt had uh, through the 70s and into the 80s, it was all Peter's, Peter's production. So he was producing James Taylor and Linda Ronstadt, and then he started uh, uh, producing a lot of other artists like... Uh, uh, Neil Diamond and Cher, uh, Diana Ross. He did the the two big 10,000 Maniacs albums were produced by Peter. Um, he was, uh, he, he's done Randy Newman and uh, he uh, got a Grammy for producing uh, the last Robin Williams comedy album. Uh, and Steve Martin and uh, uh, I mentioned the semantics earlier, which nobody's heard of. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Um, Raul Malo, who's the lead singer of the Mavericks, he did an album with him, which is great. I highly recommend that. Gosh, you would think that this would be much more quick off the top of my head. I mean, I wrote the damn book, right? <laughs> no, they can they can buy the book to get all the other there information. You go. One of the biggest hits for Linda Ronstadt's one of her first hits was Linda Ronstadt and the Stone Ponies, song mm -hmm. written by Mike Nesmith, different drum. And there's a story that Mike Nesmith was in the car the first time he heard the recording. And the monkeys were with him and they couldn't believe that he wrote the song and it was put out by Linda Ronstadt. I don't know if you've right. heard that story. Well, I also heard that he he played the song uh, to the, the, the producers that were doing the monkeys. And they said, well, that doesn't sound like a monkey's song. You know, and he said, well, but I'm a monkey. You know, I wrote it. So why isn't it a monkey song? But they didn't, they weren't interested in it. So, uh, uh, you know, he proved them wrong, giving it uh, to Linda Ronstadt and the Stone Ponies. And I mean, it, that's a great record. Yeah, that's a great story too. But I also got to say, right, a lot of people don't know, but there's a lot of things about the Beatles story that are true and not true. Some mm -hmm. are myths, some aren't. And it's like, you can spend all your life trying to work out what's reality, what's not reality. It's right. the same thing with the monkeys, okay? The monkeys never aim to go out and be the Beatles. They don't look like them. They don't sound like them because they've got the American sound. They had the greatest songwriters in the world, right? But Mike right. Nesmith wrote some of the greatest songs. And, you know, that says enough just there for me. But what I think with Mike Nesmith that a lot of people don't know, I believe that before the show started that the producers may have offered – Mike Nesmith, a big role in being producer of the music for the show. 
and that didn't oh. eventuate. And because of that, I think that's where Mike Nesmith, after that, his mum was doing liquid paper. He's coming on pretending he's playing and smiling and making his lips not working on the show. Like, you know, if anybody really wanted to sick the monkeys, eventually it was him. He couldn't help it. But yeah, I don't well. blame him because I actually think that they offered him the music producer role at the early stages and it didn't happen because then they gave it to Don Kirshner. Right. Well, they were, they were, you know, I think for them, uh, Nesmith was, you know, uh, an un, an unproven, you know, in their, in their eyes. He, I mean, cause he had a couple of singles out, you know, on, on his own under another name, yeah. which didn't do very well. Uh, so they probably said, well, no, why are we going to put all our eggs in that basket? Let's go with somebody who has a track record like Kirshner and give him a job. Uh, so I, I can understand from a production standpoint why they would do that. When Nesmith was frustrated, you know, from the beginning, I mean, they would barely let him let them play on their own records yeah. uh, and all that stuff. And he's like him and Torque were like professional yeah. musicians, kind of. That's and it's right. just like, well, what the hell is this? That's right. You know, sometimes you promise somebody something just to get them to sign. And then you can just kind of go, yeah, well, that didn't we're going to we're going to go this direction instead. And I'm sure they were pissed off, and I don't blame them, especially if you're Mike Nesmith and you're writing these great songs. And uh, I mean, like I was mentioning earlier, that stuff that he wrote on uh, Headquarters, Sunny Girlfriend, and You Told Me, and was, you know, there was a good song. So I would be frustrated too, you know. You know, the great thing I've got to say, because we're talking Beatles monkeys, but unfortunately they go hand in hand too, right? <laughs> but the thing is, you had two actors. And then you had two musicians and they crossed over. The actors became musicians. The musicians became actors. Mm -hmm. But see, David Jones was on Broadway. Mickey yeah. Dolans was already in bands, singing yeah. up front and playing guitar. So it's nothing new. But because Mickey Dolans was an actor and came from a Hollywood family, he right. just fitted in. You know, like he accepted it. And yeah. like David Jones, he was an actor and he was from Broadway and he accepted it. But not Mike and Peter because they're the frustrated musician saying, hey, we're not doing what we want to do. Right. And this music is rubbish. And we <laughs> want to do our thing. And that's what eventually happened. I've yeah. interviewed Chip Douglas, and that's on my page as well, Plastic EP mm -hmm. Facebook page. That is an amazing interview because he goes right through it, Chip. And, you know, even doing the song Daydream Believer, and that what number is this, Jim? 7 A. I mean, that's a classic at the start of a record. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. I know, man, I'm short. You know, like, I remember <laughs> that as a child. No no one came out with that kind of stuff. And yeah. the thing is, you got to understand, as the Beatles progressed and went on to a different level with Sergeant Pepper, they deserted all their teeny bopper fans, and here comes the monkey right there to pick up all the teeny bopper fans. It was like Moses yeah. parted the water, and the monkeys just went right through. That's what people yeah. don't realise. Timing is everything. That's right. I mean, it, and it certainly helps being on, you know, television, uh, you know, every week uh, back when there were only like three channels. So you didn't have a lot. <laughs> you didn't have a lot of choice. So, of course, they're going to watch the monkeys and they're going to buy the albums and as a, you know, show business package. It was yeah. it was perfect. But it's the first time people have to understand that a movie studio and a record company got together as one as a machine and mm -hmm. put them out there. And that's why success was instant. And they had four yeah. number one albums. They had number one singles. And that's what it was. It was the machine. You couldn't you couldn't beat the machine. First year, I think they grossed $20 million. Right. But yeah. from merchandise. I mean, yeah. that's unheard of. The Beatles worked their way up. You know, mm -hmm. the Beatles slogged it out in the clubs, played the cavern, went and did parties, did everything they went, went to Germany, went to all the hard slog. And the monkeys, it's... Here are you four guys of the monkeys, bang, instant yeah. success. Because they had the machine and they had the half an hour show. I don't know if you know, but the Beatles cartoons, they came out in 64, 65, King Features. They, mm -hmm. were, they had the biggest audience in America, over 50% of the audience, and they didn't show those Beatles cartoons until the 90s in the UK. Yeah, that's what I heard. I was surprised when I heard that, yeah. I want to say, David Jacks, hold up your book one more time. Tell everyone where they can get it, and can they get a signed copy anywhere? Uh, this is available at your favorite local bookstore, as well as online at uh, 
Barnes and Noble and Amazon and all that sort of stuff. As far as a signed copy, um, I think uh, if for those of you that are uh, subscribing to uh, the Fest for Beetle fans, I think they have some signed copies uh, for sale on their website. Well, I'll tell you what, this is going to be a worldwide bestseller. And I hope so. What a great book to spend 20 years of your life doing it. And people <laughs> don't understand. See, it's that's not... why I see all my hair fell out. I turned gray. It was, you know. I just want people to know out there, right? For a very small investment, you're going to get 20 years of David's work. And when you read this book, it's going to be fascinating. It's going to tell you everything about Peter Asher. And I've got to say, we love Peter Asher. As I said, I've interviewed him. He's the greatest. I know he's musical director and other people that play with him. As I said, Jeremy from uh, Chad and Jeremy is fantastic. And it's been such a pleasure having you on the show, David. I mean that sincerely. It's, it's great to, uh, to be with you. And thank you for all the, uh, the questions and the opportunity. Thanks. See you again, everybody, on the Plastic EP show. I don't want to see you again. I hear that love is planned. How can I understand when someone says to me, I don't want to see you again? Why do I cry at night? Something wrong could be right. Say it to me, I don't want to see you again As you turned your back on me, you hid the light of day I didn't have to play that broken hearted That later on, after love's been and gone I'll still hear someone say, I don't want to see you again.